Guys, I'm from Canada. My name is Carl Martel, and uh, I've been working now in the hemp industry for about seven years. So I'm an, an independent researcher and consultant. I work for companies here in Australia and across Canada. Um, so, yeah, so I've been developing products and uh, discovered this plant is truly incredible. And I think this plant really exemplifies this statement, right? In regards to that the Greeks teach us that everything can be everything. Everything can be turned and anything can be turned into anything else, right? What that really means is that, you know, you could take apart this plant and it can be used for so many different things. It's truly incredible. Um, and it's, it's the breadth that this material can actually be used for the hundreds of thousands of different products. And we're only just really now just really touching the surface as to what it can do. So what I do. So I, like I say, have been developing products both in the plastics, uh, up at the top left hand corner, this would be a composite ma ma uh, material for countertops, for example. Uh, beside it, uh, light plates, you know, accent plates for, and this would be like plastics. And then beside that again, this is kind of like my foamed hemp, so for insulation, these sort of things. Cottonizing processes, so taking the, the fiber itself and then uh, going through a cottonization process. Again, all of the chemistry that I do, it's actually green chemistry. So I don't use anything that's toxic for the environment or for people. So all of this can be done basically right in your kitchen, right? So next as well would be like paints and stains. And this, this fence here is actually eight years old. So and it still looks this way, and it's used basically just hemp oil. Now, the hemp oil that I used is um, expired food-grade hemp oil. So I was you know, told that I was brought a barrel of, of this oil and said, well, we have this, all this extra oil. What are we going to do with it? I said, well, there's either biodiesel, bioethanol, but it doesn't really work that well for that. And I thought, ah, turn it into paints and stains. And so these are based on ancient recipes. Um, my background... Um, school-wise, is I'm a geoarchaeologist, but when I got back from Europe and the Middle East, not a whole lot of work, and I got right into the hemp. So next beside that, right, is your hempcrete, right? So this is a block that uh, looking at designing, and I've made improvements to the recipe. So this block is only seven inches thick, okay? Traditional hempcrete or limecrete or lime hemp, I should say, walling systems are about 12 inches thick, so 30 centimeters. This is seven inches, and I still maintain R24 uh, in insulation value. Um, beside that is a, uh, again, it's all hemp, but it's a carbonized material or activated material with microfibrillated uh, cellulosic fibers from hemp, and that's what acts as the binder. And I created this kind of a filter that can be used, and this is where I'm doing some more research into, for desalination and water filtration. Because, because it's conductive, I can run a tiny current through it Okay, a, a small voltage across its things, and that will then actually um, take out the, the ions that are in the salt water. Lock it up into the filter, and then you can backwash it, and then collect that, and you have fresh water that comes out the bottom. Uh, beside it, these are processes, again, for uh, pulping. So turning basically your hemp into pulps, and then paper, and you can do all kinds of other things with it. Uh, down at the bottom, this is what I'm really going to be talking about today, and that is... Um, hemp biomass as activated material for electricity storage. So um, I've developed uh, a process for, for this, and we're going to go through it. And on the, these things, you can actually, I don't know if you can actually see it, and tomorrow I'll be giving workshops and other things down at the Wadzi's tents and uh, down over there. So you're all welcome to come down. I'm going to show you how to make uh, supercapacitors and these things, all from basically just paper. It's a dual carbon battery, you know, essentially what it is. Um, and that's where this kind of comes into. So beside it is basically dual carbon. You can't see the voltage, but you can run, actually run a voltage and a current through basically just paper. Uh, beside that is a flexible electrode, all hemp-based. So it's, a, it's, it's conductive, and it's made from hemp, right? And the last picture, as you can see, I don't know if you can see, right in the, the photo is an LED light that's being lit up by the material at the bottom. So I have a dual carbon material there. So one is graphite. And the other one, the material that's actually there, is the uh, activated material from the biomass, right? So I take that, activate it, and then that is what acts as your storage medium. So I charge it up, and you have a supercapacitor. So as I've just been discussing, so hemp biomass is activated material for electricity storage. So what is the activated material? It's, think of your Brita filter. 
your inside your brittle filter is basically activated carbon. So and what they use in supercapacitors is this material, right? So you're going to have basically your current collector, so it could be uh, any kind of metal, so nickel, uh, copper, aluminum, these sort of things. And then your activated carbon, okay, is what actually holds the, the charge, okay? So and that would go in between the two plates of metal, and then there's a separator. And that separator could be anything, um, you know, a piece of paper is what I use. And it could do all this. And, and this is where we're needing to kind of go beyond um, what lithium can actually do. We're actually reading the, reaching the theoretical limits of what lithium is capable of doing. And there's a difference between supercapacitors and batteries, right? And that's where we get into that. So, so basically a battery is a chemical reaction, okay, that occurs. And you'll have basically your metal anode, right, which is the sacrificial part. And it reacts with the electrolyte, okay, and that's your battery juice if you want. So if you think of a car battery, you have sulfuric acid and lead, right? And then you have a reaction that kind of goes on that creates that energy. Next beside is a supercapacitor. Now, you'll notice they're very, very similar, okay, except um, the, the charge is not so much, it, it's at the interface between the electrolyte and the activated material, okay? And it's a kind of a static electricity, if you want. Okay, so they work on a bit different. So these can be charged and discharged very, very rapidly. And a battery, you know, it takes a long time to charge and a long time to discharge. They both have um, their benefits and uses. In your electronics, batteries work really well. But if you want an electric car, this is where a supercapacitor would work really well because it can discharge very, very quickly and recharge very quickly. So here are you know, some of the materials that they use in batteries, supercapacitors, and essentially as well, the solar panels. So except just a little bit different in the way each one is used. So as I said, you have aluminum, copper, zinc, nickel, okay, would be your current collector. The separator is polyethylene or polypropylene, okay. Your electrolyte, you have different kinds, water-based, you have solid, ionic, polymers, uh, there's a whole range. And that's where uh, the lithium comes in, right? into how things kind of all work together. And then your activated material, activated carbon and graphite. At present, okay, the industry uses uh, a lot of activated carbon and, and the graphite. Now that material, activated carbon, is $15 a kilo. But with, and it comes from non-renewable resources, right? So coke from uh, coal, and then you have um, your oil, you know, oil, fossil fuels, these sort of things, are, that's where they're getting their activated carbons from, usually. And graphite. So graphite, again, is a mined mineral, right? And that's where they extract the graphene from. Now, the research into the methods of production. So, uh, for, for hemp, um, different production methods have been looked at and researched. So you go through different things, like you got hydrothermal synthesis. So, uh, that is kind of like uh, taking Mother Nature and speeding her up a bit. So you go, it, they basically put it into a high-pressure vessel with water, and you put your material into it, and then you go with heat over a period of time. Essentially the same process as that organic matter in nature would go through to become coal. Okay? And then, so that's one method. Another method is the chemical activation. Another one is physical activation. Uh, then you have physical activation or plasma. Right now, a lot of work that I do is actually through self-activation. So I'm not actually adding any kind of chemicals or physical type of uh, CO2 or steam and these sort of things to activate the material. I'm actually using the chemistry that's intrinsic in the plant itself and converting those molecules that are there to activate the material. So whereas some of the other ones, chemical and physical, you have to add, for example, potassium hydroxide, okay? and then that, through the process, will activate. And that's what makes, I think, hemp and some other biomass materials really beautiful in that they already hold a lot of the chemistry necessary okay, for creating this sort of material. Now, biomass is essentially anything that's grown, right? We have, you can get it from wood, you can get it from corn, you get it from everything. And they all seem to fall basically in a range um, for its capacitance and it's able to be used as a storage medium. 
um, at hemp, though, is, is really kind of unique, though, in some respects, because it has this physical architecture that's already built into the plant, and you're just w building upon that. And when you activate it, you have all these micropores and everything else that allow then for the use of your electrolyte to actually work within it. Now, so different researchers have actually done these things, and they've come out with uh, articles, and it's really, a lot of it is quite recent, you know, 2017, 2016, and, uh, and my work as well. So, um, Dr. Sun is the second point right there. He um, actually looked at the, the herd or the sieve. That would be the middle part of the stem, right? David Mitlin, um, back in 2012, he worked with the bass fiber, okay? Now, what I've been doing is I've actually been looking at the husk, which is the shell of the, of the seed, right? So I've been taking that, and then also the meal. As it's, after it's been pressed into oil, okay, and this is the, the not the medicinal oils, but the food grade oils. Um, so I've been taking that material, and then also the chaff, so the bud matter and the leaf. So I've been working with all of those at the moment, uh, and again, while the others are doing these. So as I said, you know, bass fiber with David Mitlin. Now he's using HTC, which is that hydrothermal carbonization. Okay, the herd as well with uh, Wei Sun was also hydrothermal carbonization, whereas uh, I've been doing the husk, the meal, the bud, and the leaf is all self-activation. So a little bit of difference in between the two. So HTC is basically, uh, you take that material under pressure, low temperatures, relatively low temperatures, about 180 degrees Celsius. Okay, so you can do this right in your oven, essentially, if you have the proper pressure vessel. Um, it takes about 24 hours to go through. And then once it comes out, you activate it again. The whole process takes a bit of time. Um, the way I'm doing things is that I'm actually taking biochar. Okay, so that can be made very, very simply and easily. And then taking that biochar and then self-activating that, so taking it a step further. So a bit higher temperatures. So I'm around eight, 900 degrees C. So to activate both the herd and the fiber using HTC, they also need up around 800 degrees Celsius. So that's a bit of a difference then between the, uh, the three of us there. Now, that being said as well, um, I've also been doing work, and this is really kind of interesting. It came to me the other day when I was developing some of these things. You know, the, the acids that they use in your batteries can be quite toxic. You know, we're talking sulfuric acid and the lead that's there. These things, when they get into the environment or even onto people, you know, can be quite detrimental. You, you know, die from the sulfuric acid and these sort of things. So I said, there's got to be better solutions out there. You know, something healthier and better for the environment. So I've actually been working with uh, deep eutectin solvents. So these are ionic liquids. So they're liquid salts. And these things here, I can make them basically with just what you get right in your kitchen. And you can create, it's like salt water as well. You can use basically salt water in these. The problem with salt water or any aqua solution is that it evaporates. Well, ionic liquids, because they're salts, they don't let, they evaporate. And you can get also higher voltages uh, and potentials with um, ionic liquids. Not quite as high as lithium at the moment, but that's where more research will go into. Um, I'm going to be looking at, you know, basically doping my activated carbon with transition metals. So by doing that, we can probably increase the potential for better capacitance and, or greater capacitance and, and higher voltages. And again, all these things really just all green chemistry. My, my plan is to have a type of battery where at the end of its life, you can take it and essentially throw it in your garden, right? And it becomes fertilizer because it's just carbon. And the ingredients for the electrolyte, you know, are something that you have in your kitchen. You know, it's or fertilizers, these sort of things. So again, it, it would be totally innocuous. <clears throat> so, electricity, the water analogy. So a lot of people, you know, they'll say to me, well, you know, what's the difference between a battery and a supercapacitor? What's the, uh, how do these things kind of work? Well, if you take the concept of a, think about a, a bucket of water. So in here we have a barrel, right? You fill that up with water. Now, you put a little hole in the bottom, okay, and that water then starts coming out. It's very, very small, and you have all your water is basically your energy, 
okay, and then a little water comes out. That would be kind of like your battery, the energy that's coming out through the bottom in that stream of water. If you increase the hole, okay, more water's coming out. So you get more power. So that's really the difference between a battery and a capacitor, one that allows for a little bit of energy going through, but constantly over a long period of time. The other one is you get lots of energy, and then boom, you can dump it all very, very fast. So when you think of your car, okay, you brake, and then when you want to accelerate, you need a lot of power. Well, you need a lot of lithium batteries to be able to make that thing go. With supercapacitors, because they charge and discharge very, very quickly, you can get that. And, you, you know, combinations of the in the future would actually be looking at that sort of thing. So you have a hybrid of batteries and supercapacitors. And there is work going on right now that they're developing what they call um, super capacitors. So I'm kind of combining the two names together. Um, and I'm hoping, you know, the future is going to, that we can use a lot more uh, things that we actually grow from agriculture, right? And tomorrow, you know, out in the, uh, the tents down below, I'll be giving workshops and actually showing basically how to actually build these kind of batteries just with paper, right? So you're taking the activated material and then you have the electrolyte and away you go. Like you can make anything like that. And so you, the size of battery that you can make at home and everything else, we won't be actually limited by uh, what the industry says. I mean, some of these batteries that for your house or something else are like $5,000 when you can actually make your own batteries. You can make your own supercapacitors. So that's where I'm kind of going in that direction there and hoping that, you know, we can use more natural products in our, in our world that we don't have to worry about uh, some of these toxic things that we're dealing with right now. So one word on graphene. So people have uh, kind of said, you know, this material is kind of like graphene. It is. It's actually outperforming graphene right now in many respects for supercapacitors. Uh, but graphene, I mean, will have its place. It's just it's, it's really expensive at the moment. We're talking between $500 and $1,000 a kilo, whereas hemp biomass or any kind of biomass activated material, it's really, we're talking pennies. And it's available all around the planet. So anywhere where you have agricultural crops, you can take and convert into this activated material, right? Instead of having to worry about mining graphite, then going through a process of reducing that graphite to graphene oxide and then down to graphene. So, and that's why it costs so expensive at the moment. So, but it has some incredible properties itself. I mean, that, that the biomass doesn't. I think that's where more research needs to be looked at. The structural properties of graphene are incredible. You know, it's stronger than metal and everything else. But you'll find as well that nanocellulose, for example, can be just as strong. And that's just really taking down, and that's where Martin Enrag with uh, Zeofoam is doing some work with the hemp plastics, right? He's discovered as well that when you play with the size of the, the structure of the, the cellulose, it can then create all kinds of different products and things that you're able to do with it. So, so again, a lot of these things that we, we talk about uh, the future can all be done with something that we grow from the ground. They don't have to actually dig it out of the ground. And that makes it totally renewable. So thank you very much. I have any questions? I have more. Any questions? <laughs> oh, are, you oh. are you going to um, answer these questions? I certainly will. I was you, oh, are you going to use that one? <laughs> Hello. Hi. I was wondering, when you talk about playing around with the structure in it, can you make condoms out of hemp? Well, actually, yeah, you probably could. Uh, oh. <laughs> oh, thanks. Yeah, the, have been looking at that. At the moment, they are somewhat soluble. Uh, I do have some plastics uh, around with me. I can show them all off afterwards. It's a, but it's biodegradable, right? So when you actually introduce water to it, it starts breaking down. I don't think really you want a condom to uh, break down while you're <laughs> taking care of things. But yes, I mean, dildos and condoms, uh, those sort of things, yes. And I think um, 
you can actually design them so that they will stay intact uh, for a certain period of time, right? Using biodegradable polymers that will stay intact in water, okay, for say uh, a month or six weeks, a year. And um, yes, over time you can actually do that. But I, I don't think we want something that will totally be 100% waterproof because then you're almost defeating the purpose because then if it gets into the environment, it's like, well, how's it gonna break down if it's resistant to moisture? Bacteria won't be able to get into it and then start breaking it down. So there's kind of a, you have to kind of uh, balance things out, I guess, in regards to how we really want to use it. But yes. I've got a quick one. Yes. Can you still only get two volts per cell? Pardon me? Can you still only get two volts per cell? Yes, right now I'm getting approximately 2.74 volts okay. um, for a cell. Now the size that I've been kind of experimenting with is about the size of a stamp, okay? Right. So what I'm doing is I, I cut a piece of paper out about the size of a stamp, and that is my activated size material. Um, and I'm able to, basically th that light that was back on that first page, that little LED light is actually 3.5 volts. Yep. Okay. So this right here is an LED light at 3.5 volts. But when it's you know, operated property, this is a, a, a toroid ferroid coil. And that will, it's an inductor that we can, you can reduce the amount of voltage actually necessary to actually run the, the light. Now, so this material here that's inside is, the voltage is really regulated, I guess, by the electrolyte. So if you have an aqueous electrolyte, say a potassium hydroxide, you're kind of limited to about two volts, okay? Um, and then your ionic liquids, you can get up to about three volts or four volts, um, depending on the electrolyte. And then lithium, you can get somewhere up to, to five. But this is where I think a lot more research and, and development will be going. Voltage, though, is not that big of a deal, though. It's really the current. In that stamp that's right there, I can actually get about a half an amp of power, 400 milliamps. That's what's really critical. Because you, say it's a, you know, just two volts. Well, you just stack more of them together. And again, like I say, yeah. that's the size of a stamp. So your surface area, say, for example, um, you can turn all these walls that are inside this building. If you look at how big, how many stamps could you fit in on this wall all the way around, right? We'll give you an idea of basically those solar panels that are on the, on the roof come in and can basically charge your wall, yeah. okay? It's a huge super, super area. So that half an amp, you know, on that yeah. little piece of paper, right, can really do quite a lot. Good? Thank you. Anybody else? All good? Thank you very much. Oh, just, just one more. Oh. Um, is there a size or a limit to the size of the battery? No. No. Uh, and that's, the, uh, that's really the beauty of this. I mean, you know, if you, somebody said, well, Carl, how about you build me a battery that's, uh, that I can put in my backyard in um, one of those uh, containers? Yeah, you can build one that's that big and you'll have whatever you know, 2,000 volts and 10,000 amps, you know, in, in something like that. So yeah, there's not really any limit to the size that you can go with this. It's just how it's wired and laid together. Like I say, so if that stamp there, I could take that stamp, okay, and multiply it, uh, say, 50 times. Well, then that would then give you, um, I'll say it's, it, it maintains a two volts, two volts times 50, right? And so you got to it. <laughs> Sorry, my math sometimes. I get a little nervous. <laughs> so that two volts 50 times, right, is 100, right? So that then would give you 100 volts. And then your amperage then would also be multiplied by that same factor. So each one of those then, so you can just make a giant one that's like this big, right? And then it's just a question of wiring. If you wanted to change the amount of voltage, it's just a question of the way the wiring is done and how much current you need to use and that sort of thing. Anything else? Can you make the individual things, say your, your, your little one size of a stamp, you can you mic. make those much bigger? This can you, yeah, can you make those bigger, the individual little things? Yes. And yeah. just, just yeah. any size, just... Doesn't matter, get, you know, get me a size of paper the size of this floor and we can yeah, make yeah. one that size. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's whatever, yeah, I mean, the walls that are on, on here, you know, you can just basically cover them with the, with the material. And you... They don't 
don't have to. No, that's right. It doesn't right. have to be ten thousand little ones. It can be five yeah. really big ones. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So any size you want. Cool. Anybody else? Great. And you guys, if anybody wants, is interested uh, tomorrow, uh, I'll be down doing workshops, and you know I can show people how to make actually these things very, very easily. So, all good.